Hello, I'm Constantin. Welcome to this video, where we'll be getting ourselves familiar with linear types. What they are, what they're used for, a little bit of theory they're based on, etc. Mathematicians and programmers work with functions on a regular basis. Uh, it's safe to say that most of the time we don't care about how many times we use a certain argument of the function in the function's body. Uh, this appears to be something very intrinsic. We can use our argument however many times we want, be it once, uh, multiple times, or not at all. In other words, we discard the argument. In the case of linear types, a certain restriction takes place. If, say, a function from A to B is declared linear, its argument of the type A has to be used exactly once in the definition of the function. No more, no less. A more formal description of what it means for an argument to be used exactly once, as well as a more formal approach on the property of linearity, will be discussed later. If we think of the values of the linear function as resources, we can already sense a major benefit. After it's been used, uh, the system can safely deallocate the object, because it's guaranteed not to be used anymore. Fun fact, Rust's ownership mechanism was inspired by linearity. Every value has exactly one owner at a time until it goes out of scope. Now let's start with something graspable. Consider these functions. f accepts an argument and returns 4. g accepts an argument and packs it and the number 4 into a pair and h accepts an argument, duplicates it, and packs the result into a pair. h is also referred to as the diagonal function. Only one of these functions can be declared linear, and that is g. f cannot be linear because it discards an argument, which is used zero times in the definition. h, on the other hand, cannot be linear because it uses the argument twice. Meanwhile, g uses this argument exactly once. To enable linear types, simply add the respective pragma to your module or include it as one of the default extensions in the default extensions key of your package.yaml file. Linear Haskell was originally described in a paper by Jean-Philippe Bernardi, Arnaud Spirwick, and others in 2018. The extension has been available since GHC version 9 and is currently experimental. To declare a function linear, we either insert percent %1 between the antecedent and the arrow or substitute the arrow with the so-called linear arrow, uh, colloquially referred to as lollipop. The true meaning of linear function is this. The function f is linear when, given that the value f of x is consumed exactly once, the argument x is consumed exactly once. First of all, what does consumed exactly once mean here? The paper introduces a rigorous definition of the phrase, depending on the structure of the argument, and considers three cases. When the argument is a function, when the argument is an arbitrary algebraic data type, and when the argument is a concrete algebraic data type like int, char, and so on, uh, the, they are referred to as the base types. First of all, to consume a value of the base type exactly once, uh, simply evaluate it. Then, to consume a value of an arbitrary algebraic data type, which is not a function, pattern match on it and consume all the constituent components of all the cases, all the constructors, exactly once. To consume a function exactly once, apply it to an argument and consume the result exactly once. Second of all, the first notation for linear functions looks peculiar. Starting from GHC 9.0, the function data type is called fun, which now not only accepts the type of the input and the type of the output, but also the multiplicity of the input. Multiplicity is the data type consisting of two nullary constructors, one and many. Or roughly speaking, how many times an argument appears in a function of the body. Or, roughly speaking, how many times an argument appears in the body of the function. The function arrow has now become a type synonym and is equal to fun applied to many. Meaning that the argument can be used however many times we want. The argument in such functions is declared unrestricted. The notation for linear functions is fun applied to one. Next. Consider the lollipop operator. This is a binary logical connective known as linear implication and is defined in linear logic. This is a binary logical connective known as a linear implication and is defined in linear logic, which inspired linear types. Linear logic was first introduced by Jean-Yves Gérard in 1987 as a refinement of classical and intuitionistic logic. A quick overview of the differences between the two. In classical logic, we're interested in the ability to tell if a statement is true or not. Also, the following three laws hold and are equivalent. The law of excluded middle, the double negation elimination law, and the Pierce's law. In intuitionistic logic, we're interested in the ability to tell if a statement uh, can be proven or not. 
none of the three aforementioned laws hold. Moreover, the converse law of contraposition cannot be proven. If this law seems familiar, that's probably because it encodes a widely used method of proof called proof by contradiction or indirect proof. Intuitionistic logic is also called constructive exactly because of the inability to use the proof by contradiction. Intuitionistic logic is also called constructive exactly because of the inability to use proof by contradiction. Also, the beloved Cary Howard isomorphism, which is the relationship between the formal mathematical statements and types, and between the proofs of those statements and the terms of those types, originally concerned intuitionistic logic. In linear logic, however, these statements, or rather formulae, are treated as resources, and there's a special modality that allows us to perform certain actions that we deem so essential in our day-to-day -day lives that we might completely disregard their formal presence in normal type systems. This will be discussed later. Another fun fact, linear implication is defined in terms of linear negation, denoted with the superscript bar up next to a term, and the so-called multiplicative disjunction, or par, which looks like an upside-down ampersand. It's similar to what the material implication is equivalent to in classical logic. A implies B is equivalent to not A or B. Before we continue with the theoretical background, let's analyze a couple of functions and decide which arguments can have multiplicity 1. Const ignores the second argument and returns the first, and since the second argument gets discarded, it can possibly have multiplicity 1. The first argument, on the contrary, can. We can immediately see that there can exist two versions of the function const, one where both arguments are regular, and the other where the first argument has multiplicity 1, and both are equally valid. However, between the two versions, the linear one is preferred. It introduces a guarantee that its first argument will be consumed exactly once, if the entire function is consumed exactly once. And in no way does it impose a restriction on its usage, which can be seen in the example below. An unrestricted list is passed to const, which accepts a linear value as its first argument. Apply applies the function to the argument. Both are used exactly once, so does that mean we can put the linear implication wherever we want? It all boils down to whether the first argument, the function from A to B, is linear or not. This is where the true definition of linearity comes in. Recall that if apply is linear, then by definition it means that if apply fx is consumed exactly once, then its arguments uh, with multiplicity 1 are consumed exactly once. Suppose apply is linear in its second argument, namely the value x. In other words, suppose x's multiplicity is 1. Can we guarantee that it is consumed exactly once? Well, it gets passed to the function f, which means that if x has multiplicity 1, then f has to be linear, because then the definition of linearity kicks in for f, and x will be 100% consumed exactly once. If x has multiplicity 1, but f is not linear, then there's no guarantee whatsoever. So the two cases highlighted in the invalid row are the exact cases where apply is linear in its second argument, but the first argument, the function, is not linear. Here's an interesting observation. All fields in the algebraic data types declared with a non-JDT syntax are linear. In other words, the constructors have linear arrows. This is true regardless of whether the extension is turned on or not and is a corollary of the definition of consumed exactly once. For example, if we define a list of weights written in the non-JDT syntax, it will be equivalent to its JDT counterpart written on the right. Now, since either and pair are defined using the regular syntax, their components are linear, which is why the function bad is invalid. The value a gets discarded. But what if we, when defining a generalized algebraic data type, could control which arguments of the constructor are linear, in which are unrestricted. Observe, this is a pair type whose first argument is explicitly declared unrestricted and the second is linear. Let's quickly go over the limitations that take place when we construct a term of that type or perform pattern matching. When we construct the term of the type UL, we must supply an unrestricted first argument. If we do the opposite, this will be invalid for the same reason why certain type signatures in apply were invalid, which we discussed earlier in the video. On the contrary, we are free to use the first field in an unrestricted way if we pattern match on the term of the type UL, despite it possibly being linear. Right, it's finally time to formalize the concept we've been using up until this point, the concept of restricting an argument to be consumed exactly once. The instruments we'll be using emerge from a branch of mathematics called mathematical logic, more specifically proof theory. This is called an unconditional judgment. This glyph to the left of the letter A is called a turnstile. 
Turnstile A is interpreted as A is true, or A holds, or A can be proven. In the Hilbert style deduction systems, the turnstile is dropped, but the resulting statement is interpreted the same way. An example below shows how to mathematically formulate the phrase, the statement A implies A can be proven. If we add a collection of hypotheses gamma, this becomes a hypothetical judgment. This is read, given the proofs of the hypotheses in the collection gamma, we can prove A. Or, whenever the hypotheses from gamma are true, A is also true. The collection of hypotheses is also referred to as context. The two examples below demonstrate the mathematical interpretations of two phrases. If we have proofs of A and A implies B, then we can prove B. Here, the context consists of two logical formulas, A and A implies B. Second, if we have a collection of hypotheses gamma in the statement A, then we can prove A. Here, the context consists of a subcollection gamma, the contents of which we do not care about, and a standalone statement A. Judgments of this shape are usually present in natural deduction systems. If the collection of hypotheses is empty, the judgment becomes unconditional. So far, we've worked with a single statement to the right of the turnstile, which is also called the conclusion. If we allow there to exist a collection of conclusions, possibly empty, then we get a generalized form of a natural deduction judgment, which is called a sequence. Sequence are key objects in sequent calculus. The standard interpretation is this. Whenever every hypothesis of the collection gamma is true, at least one conclusion in the collection delta is true. Classical, intuitionistic, and linear logic can be defined as the respective sequent calculi. Finally, a beast of this form is called a rule of inference. A list of premises, each of which is a judgment. A big dividing line called the inference line, uh, dividing the premises and the conclusion. And a conclusion, which is a judgment. Rules of inference are the fundamental blocks which define a logical system. And here is how to interpret them. Whenever we are given a finite set of premises pi, and each of them is a valid judgment, we can draw a conclusion c. By valid judgment, I mean a judgment that is either an axiom, in other words, a rule of inference without premises, or is a conclusion of another inference rule defined within the framework of the given logical system. Which means if we stick a bunch of inference rules together, we can construct proof trees. The nodes of the trees are the judgments, the leaves are the axioms, and the root of the tree is the original statement we had to prove. Funnily enough, in contrast to the visual representations of data structures, this kind of tree grows the usual way, bottom up. Here's an example of a very common rule of inference called conjunction introduction. If from gamma we can prove A, and from the same gamma we can prove B, then from the same gamma we can prove the conjunction of A and B. Okay, this is well and good, but given what we've learned so far, we haven't actually analyzed concrete examples of logical systems. This isn't exactly what we're after. Remember, we're here to dissect a black box that implements the restriction of the argument usage. Well, fret not, we're right at the culmination of the discussion. Enter structural rules. A structural rule is an inference rule that operates on hypotheses or conclusions in a judgment or a sequent. We will look at the three common structural rules. Exchange or permutation allows us to swap hypotheses or conclusions in a sequent. The indexed Greek letters denote the possibly empty collections of hypotheses or conclusions. Suppose we have a following judgment. I'm a human. If I'm a human, then I drink water. And the conclusion is, I drink water. If exchange is permitted, then the judgment with the first two premises swapped follows from the original. If I'm a human, then I drink water. I'm a human, therefore I drink water. And it does sound logical to us. This is something we don't even think about, because we do this automatically, during conversations, when we solve logical tasks, or in programs. More on that later. Weakening allows us to insert an additional hypothesis or conclusion given the validity of the original premise. Let's use our illustrative judgment again. I'm a human. If I'm a human, then I drink water. Therefore, I drink water. If weakening is permitted, then the following judgment follows from the original. I'm a human. If I'm a human, I drink water. The floor is lava, therefore I drink water. The additional hypothesis I just added didn't seem to bring anything to the table, and yet the validity of the judgment was retained. This is something that is also intrinsically logical to us. Contraction allows the removal of a duplicate hypothesis or conclusion given the validity of the premise. I'm a human. I'm a human. If I'm a human, then I drink water. Therefore, I drink water. 
If I remove the first duplicate premise, it's, it still sounds valid. We can reason about weakening and contraction in reverse order, just like one would do if uh, they were to construct a proof tree from the bottom up, starting with a statement that needs to be proven. Okay. Suppose we have a hypothesis A, and we need to prove something. If we think we're capable of proving that something without A, we can ignore it and continue without it. Likewise for contraction. If we think we, for whatever reason, might need to duplicate the hypothesis to prove a statement, we can do that. Here's how we're going to strike the final blow. As previously mentioned, the Curry-Howard isomorphism links together logical statements with types and proofs of those statements with terms of those types. And it originally concerned intuitionistic logic, where we cannot have more than one conclusion in a judgment. The hypotheses transform into types, and each type gets bound to a term, an argument. Weakening means discarding an argument, and contraction means duplicating an argument. A normal type system is a system with all the three structural rules permitted. A linear type system prohibits the contraction and weakening rules, leaving off only the exchange rule. Since, as mentioned previously, weakening means discarding an argument, in other words, enabling the possibility to use it zero times, and contraction means duplicating an argument, in other words, enabling the possibility to use it more than once, linear type systems ensure that an argument is used exactly once. Linear logic does exactly the same thing. It explicitly bans these two rules. However, it introduces the so-called exponentials to recover the lost expressiveness. We'll be interested in one of the exponentials called the of course modality, or the bank modality, denoted with the exclamation mark. Because the weakening and contraction rules with this modality appear on the left-hand side where the arguments reside. The regular implication in linear logic is defined in terms of the linear implication by sticking the of course modality to the antecedent. Translating this idea into linear Haskell, we get the generalized algebraic data type called unrestricted that stores an unrestricted argument. Notice the regular arrow. The set of unrestricted functions from A to B is equivalent to the set of linear functions from an unrestricted A to B, which can be proven quite easily by supplying a pair of bijections that are each other's inverses, like to and from on the slide. Now, let's talk about the perks of linear types. At the beginning of the video, I mentioned one of them, and that is to do with memory management. Once an object has been used, we can safely deallocate it. And because of that, garbage collection may not be needed for the linear values. Second, with the help of linear types, we can enforce a strict type-driven syntax to ensure the correct use of the resource. Bernardi and others put forward an alternative definition of the I.O. data type, which accepts a multiplicity parameter. Recall that a regular I.O. is effectively a function that accepts a real world, it returns a pair of a new real world, and a value of the type A. The new version, I.O. sub L, becomes a linear function with a real-world argument where the real-world argument is a linear value. The new real-world is also linear, but the multiplicity of the value of the type A now depends on the multiplicity passed as a parameter to IO sub L. For example, the function read accepts a file and returns an IO sub L wrapping the new file, which is linear, and an unrestricted character. And the new file is actually the same one, it's just that we have to return a new value, because otherwise we would have had to reuse the file, which is prohibited. The linearity of the new file ensures that we would need to use it to, for example, close the resource eventually. We can now sense a drawback of linear types. If a value is linear, but we want to continue working with it, we need to explicitly return it and use the newly returned one, since we can't use the already consumed original one. Good news, in 2022, a new paper has been published by Arno Spiewak and others, where this problem is tackled with the so-called linear constraints. Hopefully this extension will see the light of day in the foreseeable future. Linear types also help perform in-place non-monadic updates for mutable collections. Regular mutable arrays usually operate within the ST or the IO monads. Unfortunately, this makes them too sequential. In contrast, the non-monadic approach opens up possibilities for parallelism though we need to be careful with the in-place updates. It is only safe to perform them if there are no other pointers to the value in the collection. In conclusion, today we've studied some theoretical background on linear type systems that restrict the use of the argument. It has to be consumed exactly once. 
We've glanced at the portion of the linear types language extension, at the ways to define linear functions, at the restrictions that take place when we pass linear values to other functions. We have also seen how generalized algebraic data types can help us control linearity by explicitly stating which fields have multiplicity 1. With this instrument, we were able to create a data type that encapsulates an unrestricted value. And we've shown that a linear arrow that accepts an unrestricted value is equivalent to a regular arrow. And finally, we've touched upon the perks of linear types. Thanks for watching! All the links to the research papers, the wiki articles, the encyclopedic entries, and the blog posts are in the description. If you happen to have gained something useful out of this video, or if it sparked an interest in linear types or linear logic, sharing your thoughts in the comment section, or sharing the video to your colleagues who might have interest in these subjects as well. If you want to see more Haskell-related videos, consider subscribing to the channel.